Hello and welcome to Earth Science Lecture 17, Atmospheric Temperature Controls. People probably notice changes in air temperature more often than they notice changes in any other element of weather. At a weather station, the temperature is monitored on a regular basis from instruments mounted in an instrument shelter. The shelter protects the instrument from direct sunlight and allows a free flow of air. The daily maximum and minimum temperatures underlie much of the basic temperature data compiled by meteorologists. By adding the maximum and minimum temperatures and then dividing by two, the daily mean temperature is calculated. The daily range of temperature is computed by finding the difference between the maximum and minimum temperatures for a given day. The monthly mean is calculated by adding together the daily means for each day of the month and dividing by the number of days in that month. The annual mean is an average of the 12 monthly means. And the annual temperature range is computed by finding the difference between the highest and lowest monthly means. Mean temperatures are particularly useful for making comparisons, whether on a day, monthly, or annual basis. It is quite common to hear weather reporters make statements such as, last month was the hottest July on record, or today Chicago was 10 degrees warmer than Miami. Temperature ranges are also useful statistics because they give an indication of extremes. To examine the distribution of air temperatures over large areas, isotherms are commonly used. An isotherm is a line that connects points on a map that have the same temperature, so note iso means equal and therm means temperature. Therefore, all points through which an isotherm passes have identical temperatures for that time period indicated. Generally, isotherms representing 5 degree or 10 degree temperature differences are used, but any interval may be chosen. The figure here illustrates how isotherms are drawn on a map. Notice that most isotherms do not pass directly through the observing stations because the station's readings may not coincide with values chosen for the isotherms. Only an occasional station temperature will be exactly the same as a value of the isotherm, so it is usually necessary to draw the lines by estimating the proper position between stations. Maps with isotherms are valuable tools because they make the temperature distribution visible at a glance. Areas of low and high temperatures are easy to pick out. In addition, the amount of temperature change per unit distance, called the temperature gradient, is easy to visualize. Closely spaced isotherms indicate a rapid change in temperature, whereas more widely spaced lines indicate a more gradual rate of change. The isotherms are closer in Colorado and Utah, which shows a steeper uh, temperature gradient whereas the isotherms are spread further apart in Texas, which means there's a gentler change in temperature. Without isotherms, a map would be covered with numbers representing temperatures at dozens or hundreds of places, which would make the pattern difficult to see. And then in the inset on the bottom right, you can just see color added to make this figure really pop. A temperature control is any factor that causes temperature to vary from place to place and from time to time. The primary controls of temperature include differential heating of land and water, altitude, geographic position, cloud cover and albedo, and ocean currents. So what we're going to focus on for the rest of this relatively brief lecture is each of these controls. How does each of these affect temperature at a given location? So let's step through the list and we're going to start with latitude. Earlier, we t examined the most important cause for temperature variations, differences in solar radiation. Because variations in the angle of the sun and length of the day depend on latitude or how far away from the equator you are, they are responsible for warm temperatures in the tropics and colder temperatures at the more poleward locations. Of course, seasonal temperature changes at a given latitude occur as the sun's vertical rays migrate toward and away from a place during the year. The figure here reminds us of the importance of latitude as a control of temperature. Data for these five cities reminds us that latitude is a significant factor in determining temperatures. 
Places located at higher latitudes, that is toward the poles, experience large temperature difference between summer and winter. Note that Cape Town, South Africa experiences winter in June, July, and August, so it's the opposite. But latitude is not the only control of temperature. If it were, we would expect all places along the same parallel of latitude to have identical temperatures. This is clearly not the case. For example, Eureka, California and New York City are both coastal cities at about the same latitude, and both have an annual mean temperature of 52 degrees. However, New York City is 16 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than Eureka in July and 18 degrees cooler in January. In another example, two cities in Ecuador, Quito and Guayaquil, are relatively close to each other. Yet, the annual mean temperatures of these two cities differs by 21 degrees Fahrenheit. So this graph is just showing that. Um, so it shows more northward or poleward locations like Winnipeg, Manitoba in Canada, um, St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, Alaska. So you'll see there's large variations in their temperature because they're more poleward. But when you're closer to the equator at just 4 degrees, perhaps, the temperature hardly changes at all throughout the year. The heating of Earth's surface directly influences the heating of the air above it. Therefore, to understand variations in air temperature, we must understand the variations in heating properties of the different surfaces that Earth presents to the Sun, that is, soil, water, trees, ice, and so on. Different land surfaces absorb varying amounts of incoming solar radiation which in turn causes variations in the temperature of the air above. The greatest contrast, however, is not between different land surfaces, but between that of land and water. Land heats more rapidly and to higher temperatures than water, and it cools more rapidly and to lower temperatures than water. Variations in air temperature, therefore, are much greater over land than they are over water. This figure on the right illustrates this idea very nicely. This satellite image shows surface temperatures in portions of Nevada, California, and the adjacent Pacific Ocean on the afternoon of May 2, 2004, during a spring heat wave. Land surface temperatures are clearly much higher than the water surface temperatures. The image shows the extreme high surface temperatures in Southern California and Nevada in dark red. Surface temperatures in the Pacific, however, are much lower. The peaks of the Sierra Nevada are still capped with snow and form a cool blue line down the eastern side of California. So that's why you see this cool temperature here. But this is the coast of California. Notice that the land is much warmer. We're talking 80s to 100 degrees, whereas the water right next to it is, I mean, 40, 50 degrees in temperature. So there's a huge difference between the two. So let's discuss why. Why do land and water heat and cool differently? Well, several factors are responsible. The first of these four factors we'll discuss is the most complicated, but it involves something that we call specific heat. The, the specific heat, which is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius, is far greater for water than for land. Thus, water requires a great deal more heat to raise its temperature to the same uh, amount that it does equally for land. So it, specific heat basically just says you need to put in more energy to keep it um, increasing temperature like it would on land. Next, land surfaces are opaque, so heat is absorbed directly at the surface. Water, however, being more transparent, allows heat to penetrate to a depth of many meters, and so it can heat underlying layers as well. So not all of the energy is used at the surface. Next, the water that is heated often mixes with water below, thus distributing the heat through an even larger mass. So even if a lot of the heating does occur at the surface, cooler waters are, and these warmer waters are mixing, and so that can affect the temperature as well. And last but not least, evaporation, which is a cooling process uh, from water bodies, is greater than that from surfaces on land. So all of these factors collectively cause water to warm more slowly, um, store greater quantities of heat, and cool more slowly than land.
Monthly temperature data for two cities will demonstrate this moderate, moderating influence of a large body of water and the extremes associated with land. Vancouver, British Columbia, is located along the windward Pacific coast, where Winnipeg, Manitoba, is a continental uh, city far from the influence of water. So you can see that on the small map in the middle of the figure, where the two locations of these cities are. The two cities are at, are at about the same latitude and thus experience similar angles of the sun and lengths of daylight. Winnipeg, however, has a mean January temperature that is 20 degrees lower than Vancouver's. Conversely, Winnipeg's July mean is 2.6 degrees Celsius higher than Vancouver's. Although their latitudes are nearly the same, Winnipeg, which has no water influence, experiences much greater temperature extremes than does Vancouver. The key to Vancouver's moderate year-round climate is the Pacific Ocean. On a different scale, the moderating influence of water may be also demonstrated when temperature variations in the northern and southern hemispheres are compared. In the northern hemisphere, 61% is covered by water, and land accounts for the remaining 39%. In the southern hemisphere, however, 81% is covered by water and only 19% by land. So, please take a moment to pause this and watch the video I've linked in the YouTube description or at the following address. Okay, continuing down our list of temperature controls, we come to altitude. Concepcion and La Paz, Bolivia, both have nearly the same latitude, about 16 degrees south of the equator. However, both La Paz, uh, because La Paz is high in the Andes Mountains at about 13,461 feet, it experiences much cooler temperatures than Concepcion, which is at an elevation of only 1,608 feet. Recall that temperatures drop at an average of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer in the atmosphere, that is about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet, in the troposphere. Thus, cooler temperatures are to be expected at higher altitudes. Yet, the magnitude of the difference is not explained completely by that normal lapse rate we discussed. If the normal lapse rate is used, we would expect uh, Quito to be about 18 degrees cooler than Guayaquil. Um, but the difference is only about 12 degrees Celsius. The fact that high altitude places such as Quito are warmer uh, than the value calculated using a normal lapse rate results from the absorption and re-radiation of solar energy by the ground surface. So the point here is that altitude of course matters. The higher up you are, typically the cooler on average it will be. All right, well, geographic position also matters. The geographic setting can greatly influence the temperatures experienced at a specific location. A coastal location where prevailing winds blow from the ocean onto shore, which means it's a windward coast, experiences considerably different temperatures than does a coastal location where the prevailing winds blow from land toward the ocean, which is a leeward coast. In the first situation, the windward coast experiences the full, moderating influence of the ocean, cool over summers and mild over winters, compared to an inland station at the same latitude. A leeward coast, on the other hand, will have a more continental temperature pattern because the winds do not carry the ocean's influence on shore. Eureka, California and New York City, the two cities mentioned earlier, illustrate this aspect of geographic position. They're at the same rough latitude, they're both against oceans, but because of the way the winds blow, it affects their temperature significantly. The annual temperature range at New York City is 34 degrees Fahrenheit greater than it is at Eureka's. So even though they're both at the same latitude, they're both near water, because winds blow water uh, conditions, I guess you could say, over Eureka, it's more like a, a coastal city than New York is because that has winds coming off the land instead. Seattle and Spokane, both in the state of Washington, illustrate a second aspect of geographic position, mountains that act as barriers. Although Spokane is only about 220 miles south, uh, excuse me, east of Seattle, the towering Cascade Range mountains separate the cities. Consequently, Seattle's temperatures show a marked marine influence, 
But Spokane's are more typical of a continental uh, situation. Spokane is 13 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than Seattle in January and 7 degrees warmer than Seattle in July. The annual temperature range at Spokane is 20 degrees Fahrenheit greater than at Seattle. The Cascade Range effectively cuts off Spokane from the moderating influence of the ocean. Next, you may have noticed that clear days are often warmer than cloudy ones, and that clear nights are usually cooler than cloudy ones. Cloud cover is another factor that influences temperature in the lower atmosphere. Studies using satellite images show that any particular time, or at any particular time, about half of our planet is covered by clouds. Cloud cover is important because many clouds have a high albedo. Clouds reflect a significant portion of sunlight that strikes them back into space. By reducing the amount of incoming solar radiation, clouds reduce daytime temperatures. At night, however, clouds have the opposite effect, as they do during the day. They act as a blanket absorbing radiation emitted by Earth's surface and redirecting a portion of it back to the surface. Consequently, some of the heat that otherwise would have been lost remains near the ground. Thus, nighttime air temperatures do not drop as low as they would on a clear night. The effect of cloud cover is to reduce the daily temperature range by lowering the daytime maximums and raising the nighttime minimums. Clouds are not the only phenomenon that increases albedo and thereby reduces air temperatures. We also recognize that snow and ice-covered surfaces have high albedos. This is one of the reasons mountain glaciers do not melt away in the summer and is why snow may be uh, present on a mild spring day. In addition, during the winter, when snow covers the ground, daytime maximums on a sunny day are less than they would be otherwise because the energy that the land would have absorbed and used to heat air has been lost. And I actually showed this in the previous lecture with an example from January of 2019. And then we have basically the last temperature control. We sort of have two more, but uh, world temperatures. From hot colors near the equator to cool colors toward the poles, these maps portray sea level temperatures in the seasonally extreme months of January on top and July in the bottom. Temperature distribution is shown by using isotherms. On these maps, you can study global temperature patterns and the effects of controlling factors of temperature, especially latitude, that distributes uh, the distribu excuse me, the distribution of land and water, and even ocean currents. As with most other isotherm maps of large regions, all temperatures of these world maps have been reduced to sea level to eliminate the complications caused by differences in altitude. On both maps, the isotherms generally trend east and west, showing a decrease in temperatures toward the poles away from the tropics. They illustrate one of the many um, or most fundamental aspects of world temperature distribution that the effectiveness of incoming solar radiation in heating Earth's surface from the atmosphere above is largely a function of latitude. In other words, again, how far away you are from the equator. Moreover, there is a latitudinal shifting of temperatures caused by seasonal migrations of the sun's vertical rays. To see this, compare the color bands by latitude on the two maps. On the January map, the hot spots of 30 degrees Celsius or more are south of the equator. But in July, they have shifted north of the equator. So that's because it follows summer. So in summer, we have the hottest pockets in the northern hemisphere. And when it's summer in the southern hemisphere, we see it warmer down there. If latitude were the only control of temperature distribution, our analysis could end here. But that's not the case. The added effects of the differential heating of land and water is also reflected on the January and July temperature maps. The warmest and coldest temperatures are found over land. Note that the coldest area, the purple oval in Siberia, and the hottest areas, the deep orange ovals, all over land. Because temperatures do not fluctuate as much over water as over land, the north-south migration of isotherms is greater over the continents than it is over the oceans. In addition, 
it is clear that the isotherms in the southern hemisphere, where, uh, where there is little land and where the oceans predominate, are much more regular than the northern hemisphere, where they bend sharply northward in July and southward in January over the continents. Isotherms also show the presence of ocean currents. Warm currents cause isotherms to be deflected toward the poles, whereas cold currents cause the equatorial bending. The horizontal transport of water poleward warms the overlying air and results in air temperatures that are higher than would otherwise be expected for that latitude. Conversely, currents moving toward the equator produce cooler than expected air temperatures. So you can actually see that a little bit here. Um, perhaps in the bottom figure, you can see warm air coming up from the equator, so it bends the isotherms up a little bit and down a bit here. Because the figure shows the seasonal extremes of temperature, they can be used to evaluate variations in the annual range of temperatures from place to place. A comparison of the two maps shows that a station near the equator has a very small annual range because it experiences little variation in the length of daylight, and it always has a relatively high song angle. A station in the middle latitudes, however, experiences wide variations in sun angle and length of daylight, and hence large variations of temperature. Therefore, we can state that the annual temperature range increases with increasing latitude. Moreover, land and water also affect seasonal temperature variations, especially outside the tropics. A continental location must endure hotter summer days and colder winters than a coastal location. Consequently, outside the tropics, the annual temperature range will increase with an increase in uh, uh, continentality. So, let us conclude this lecture with a few questions. Question number one, the lines on this map are called what? Alright, so it does depict a temperature gradient, but the lines themselves are called isotherms. Isobars was thrown in there to throw you off. We will learn about isobars soon, but that's uh, a term for equal pressure, not equal temperature. Question two. The variations in temperature are less extreme in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere because why? Well, this has to do with the differential heating of land and water. It's because there is more water in the southern hemisphere. So we have smaller changes in temperatures as a result. Okay, and last but not least, question three. On a or an blank day, there will likely be blank variation in temperature at a given location. So find the answer that has the two words that fit best, respectively. Okay, the answer here is, on an overcast day, there will likely be less variation in temperature at a given location. Alright, as always, thanks for watching and have a great day.